Thank you. I had these all in order, and now I've changed my mind. So. I'd like to start out with um, um, a couple family poems that, um, oh, some of the poems I write are about my childhood or about things I remember or imagined or about other people's childhoods, and I pretend like they're my own. But um, this is a poem called Weather Witching. Above Grandma's kitchen sink, a barometer tells the weather. On days that promise to be sunny and fair, two plastic children pop out of the arch door under a pointed roof. On days that threaten wicked weather, a witch comes out and scares the children back inside. I knew that witch lived not inside the plastic chalet, but in the house next door to Grandma's. I saw her fingers bony pull the window shades aside, the wisps of white gray hair showing in the corner of the window before I raced across the forbidden weed-grown yard to the safety of Grandma's porch. Uh, the next poem is one that um, every time I give a poetry reading, we have a discussion. Anyone who's going to introduce me says, how do you pronounce your name? And I always have to say, I don't know. Um, when I was born, my parents wanted to name me Tammy. And they thought that that just didn't seem um, flamboyant enough or something. And so um, the... The story I've heard is that my father went up to the hospital room with his pad and his pen and wrote down all of the possible names you could get Tammy out of, and they decided on Tamara, and then thought of all the possible ways that you could write Tamara, and they decided the O in the middle was unique, and um, proceeded to never call me that. Um, I was called Tammy all my life, and when I went to the university and started using Tamara, people would always say, how do you pronounce your name? And of course, I would say, I don't know. So I called my father one day, and I said, Daddy, how do you pronounce my name? People are asking me. And he said, um, Tammy. <laughs> and I said, no, no, the real name, the whole name. And he said, I don't know. And, and so I don't know. I've been pronouncing it Tamara. Anyway, this is a history of other people's names. So this is the history of names. Names handed down connect generations. But in my time, people are named for poetry, not history. Tamara, Terry, Sybil, Shauna, Sue, pretty names without a past. My grandmother and I walk through the cemetery. She tells me the names on the tombstones. My great-great-grandmother, Sarah Nevada, named for her grandmother, Sally, was born in a covered wagon crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains. I remember my great-grandmother, Matilda, named for her grandmother. She would feed us garden fresh raspberries with cream and homemade noodles with big chunks of beef. My great aunt Catherine made wedding cakes for everyone in the county and beyond. Her tractor found the only patch of ice on the country road and turned her over into a ditch. My, her great grandmother Catherine, 13 when she married, would play in the fields with her children instead of starting supper for her husband. As I drive my grandmother home, I know I could never find that cemetery again or those headstones her flowers find so easily. My children must be named for their history. Welcome Matilda, Sarah Catherine. Welcome to your past. Um, this poem is going to be in the upcoming edition of the Elkhorn Review, as is this next one, Fireflies. And this is one of the poems that was not written about my own childhood. This was somebody else's childhood. Grandmom sways on the porch swing, repeating gossip about people I don't know. Mr. Mackey hurt his back and lost his job. That glass girl down the road's getting married, always was a flighty thing. I push the swing too hard. She purses her lips, but doesn't make me slow down. The locusts drone from the walnut trees beyond the sidewalk, broken into a thousand cracks to avoid, while I gather the round green nuts and jump to grab a handful of red black fruit from the mulberry tree. At the first flash from the yard, I beg to catch the fireflies, and Grandma forces an old screwdriver through the lid of a perfectly good mason jar. I chase the sparks through the yard, around the bushes, into the garden, filling the jar with light, but not as brave as Karen Simmons, who smears the bugs on her finger, a glowing ring. When the dark deepens in the bushes and around the trees, Grandmom calls me in, where garden fresh raspberries are waiting in a bowl of cream, and she lets me turn off the light in the kitchen to watch firefly reflections dance glimmering across the milk.
The next poem I want to read is special. It's uh, about a friend of mine who I met um, four years ago today. And this is going to be in the um, current edition of the Platte Valley Review, the winter edition. This is Conductor. Before you come, I hear the whistle blow the crossing. I wait. You, wearing your cap, carrying your grip, smell faintly of diesel fuel and kerosene. You tell me of watching from the cupola fields f covered with fireflies, walking the train in the siding, switching cars in Crete. When I drive you to the station, we watch the train roll by, first the engines, then the freight cars gathering speed, till you climb onto the caboose, moving away, and wave to me from the platform. I follow the train to Sutton to hear the crossing whistle, see you waving from the cupola, see your cap in the cupola, see you waving. This next poem is Jogger. I'm not a jogger. When we jog together, you show me how to stretch out before we leave home and how to run on the balls of my feet. We jog until my side stitches slow us to a brisk walk. You check your chronograph and say we ran 10 minutes. Today you had to work late, so I donned my sweats and laced my running shoes and ran our route alone. After three blocks, I left the path. The leaves under my feet crackled brown and rust. No children were on the playground. I sat on the swing and watched the black, bare branches dance across the almost sunset sky. I jumped from the swing. I'm not a jogger. I'm just another poet who can't resist the rustle of fallen leaves or the design of trees against pink clouds. I walked slowly home, and when you called, I said, I went for a run, but my time wasn't good. Uh, living in Nebraska, especially in the summer, is sometimes sort of tough, especially when you have to go to school every day. So this poem is Dreaming of Florida from Centennial Mall, Lincoln. I walk up from campus, sandals hanging from my hand, backpack hanging from my shoulder. The cobblestones indenting my soles are nothing like the white hot sand sifting through his toes as he walks along the sunny beach. Sitting on a wooden bench in the shade of a linden tree, I listen to the water tumbling into the fountain pool and picture him listening to the waves break on the sand. I remember the first thunderstorm we spent at Emerald Lake, watching the lightning run through the clouds, listening to the thunder crash around us like the ocean must run along the shore and the waves break on the sand at his feet. I squint into the fountain where the sun reflects off the water. In Florida, he closes his eyes to the too bright glare as the sun reflects off the gulf into his eyes too. This next poem um, was in the Long Pond Review in 88, January, and um, it's Moonset. This was sort of a revelation to me. I went out to the lake one night late, and um, there were all sorts of waterfowl, and it sounded to me exactly as though they were laughing, like they were having some huge duck party. And um, I didn't know that's what ducks sounded like. I grew up in the cities, but this is Moonset. The moon slides into the lake. The sliver of moon, that silver fingernail, drops lower from the sky to the water, turning from silver to gold to red gold, drops into the low guffaws of the ducks, the high titters of snipes, tenor laughter of the geese. A flash shoots through the dipper. I call money, money, then think of a thousand better wishes, a hooded sweatshirt so I could sit on the pier another hour, or better, the language of the birds so I could get in on the ducks' big joke. Uh, this next poem um, has a visual aid. It's written, so it's, it's called Geese, and so it's written in the V of the geese. Geese. The angle of these geese cuts a wedge across this late day sky where the sun licks the clouds with red gold fire. Their sharp silhouette slices unscathed through the flames. And um, this next one is naming the fish. I'm a vegetarian, and so I, I don't go fishing. I can't hunt. Um, it upsets me, you know, to kill animals. I have pet fish, Waldo and Jackie. But I have a friend who likes to fish, and so I go out on the boat. 
but um, what happens is he will catch the fish and then I name them and and then we can't eat them because they're you know they have beings then and so we end up throwing all the fish away and so this is naming the fish no rain tonight the dipper holds its water but before dawn the bear will turn head over heels and water can pour from the heavens the lake is calm as you bait your hook shore lights skate to us across the ripples fires of the shore fishers flicker orange near the dam I name the fish you catch the first one's not a keeper. He cries as you hold his gills, mews as you ease the hook from his mouth. I call him Skippy before you slide him over the side. The half full moon slides silver drops, a shimmering trail across the water. Next week, the moon will be a rose flower. The next fish bites hard. You fight him in. I call him Dave. You use pliers to pry the tri barb hook from his mouth before you toss him wriggling into the lake. When Orion's up, Scorpio's not. The gods promised these earthly enemies, the hunter and the scorpion who killed him, separate sides of the sky, never to meet in the heavens. Your line jerks hard. You let it bite, play itself out. It nibbles. You pull away too fast. It swims away, nameless. I think this next one is still my favorite poem. Um, it's been sent out I don't know how many times, and apparently it's nobody else's favorite poem, but, but I still like it. It's called Darkling. Far offshore, the quiet lights of fishing boats shine red and green and white, calm as the sweet lime smell of the margaritas we carry to the cool, dark sand. Bats flap invisible from the copse of pines out over the water, killdeer squeal. We leave our clothes a pile on the sand, wade bare into dark water. The moon catches the curve of your back, hides its face against a cloud. The water's ice against my stomach, against my breast. The killdeer squeals, pull me close. The moon leads its trail to us across the ripple of water. A boat with furled white sail, white light shining against the moon's silver, passes silent through our night. This next one is Ghosts. I wrote it after listening to um, spooky music. It was part of a class assignment. And it turned out well. Ghosts. Wind chimes on the patio. You can hear the breeze, a ghostly sound in the slate gray dusk. The hollow sound of darkness, the yard so black you can't see the trees, you can't see the back fence, you can't see the hedgerow as it whispers in the night. Can you hear? or only feel the ghosts creeping through the yard. They plaster themselves against the house and try to push through the patio window. The yard is filled with ghosts. They push and shove, they claw and cry. Light sneaks through the trees. Its blue and gray swallows the darkness and fades the ghosts, calming their ravings. Morning ghosts devour the day. Uh, this next poem was in Plain Songs um, in the fall of 1986. Um, I don't really feel like this. I'm much better now. This is Halloween. The death gray sky closes around me as I walk through the cobweb-colored day. Desolation clings fast to me, hanging onto my hair, sticking to my clothing, snaring me in its web. Leaves crackle under my feet, crunching bones, thousands of corpses trampled to dust. My suicide eyes see shattered amber glass. I picture the golden paring knives carving a jack-o'-lantern's toothsome grin across my tender wrist. My pumpkin won't bleed pulp and seeds. Another corpse for other feet to trample to dust. And this poem was the very first poem I ever published. It was in Plain Songs in winter of 84. And it had no title at that time. Actually, it still has no title. But after this experience, I've started titling all my poems because when it appeared in the book, up above the poem, it said, Untitled. And I thought, oh, that's, that's, that's not good. So after that, all my poems got titles. So this one is not called Untitled. I've seen the pictures. I know it's a tadpole I couldn't even see without a microscope. I read in the papers how people say that death is bad, but I say that life is bad when no one cares, and it's not that good when someone does. And I couldn't care enough to make a difference. I feel the changes in my body as it prepares for the life it sure will come. 
while I prepare my mind for the death that is more certain. This is my latest revision. There's never enough time. You call from phone booths on your way home with a minute to spare. I plead to keep you on the line. Don't hang up, just one more minute. Clinging to time, hoarding the seconds like a miser, savoring each moment. I want to stay with you forever. No, it's time to go. Hiding from time, crouch down in the back seat of your car. No one will know I'm with you. Even time can't find me here, but it does. It's time, you say. Just a couple more minutes, I plead. No, we don't have a couple minutes. You don't have to go back to her. Leave me waiting for the phone calls, waiting for the stolen moments, time crawling all over me. This is, now, this poem will take us into the traveling phase. This is Travelers, and it was written in Plain Songs. It was published in Plain Songs, winter of 87. And this has um, absolutely no connection to me at all. I have no idea where this poem came from. They head toward the unknown, all their belongings in the back seat of an old blue Dodge, counting the miles by carcasses of truck tires and two slow animals, searching for fortune in roadside cafes. Bean fields zigzag past the car windows, pastures striped with trees and polka dotted by, cloud, by cows. They search for their future at rest areas with truck drivers and vacationing families. Hot air blasts through the windows, billows the clothes in the back seat. They seem almost alive. They seek fame in a sleazy motel with no sanitized strip on the toilet and a dirty water glass. Um, when I graduated from college, I had the great fortune to be able to go to Europe for three weeks. Um, as part of a class trip, I got credit for it. Um, the school paid my tuition. So I, it was like the chance of a lifetime. And I spent um, a lot of time in England and about five days in Paris and got a few poems out of it and got a lot of slides that I show to my students every semester. And this is one of the poems, Paris Soul. As I walk through the most beautiful city in the world, I imagine you beside me instead of all the way across the ocean. I walk along the Seine in the, shou in the shadow of La Tour Eiffel and want to be holding your hand. The naughty postcard stalls and book vendors along the left bank are no fun alone, and I want a street portrait of us both. The t-shirts in the souvenir shop shout Jim Perry, and I think how much je t'aime so far away. From the towers of Notre Dame, I want to share with you the view of Paris. I want to sip wine with you in a sidewalk cafe and watch the tourists and the European ladies in the latest Paris fashions and the Indian beggars in rags along the Champs-Élysées. Then return to a quaint hotel and tell the concierge ne dérangez pas. And this next poem is York Minster. York was, I think, the highlight of my trip and the um, York Minster was, I think, the, the largest church I've ever seen in my life. It was amazing, and they have Roman ruins underneath. And um, if I ever get the chance, I will go back to York. This is York Minster. Everything is so old here. The oldest stained glass in England rains its drops of colored light, along with the other windows dropping their colored rain on me and on the floor to leave iridescent petals. The cathedral is too big to be a church. I wonder at the gilded choir, the massive altar, the graves and statues. There are Roman ruins under the church. They say Bede was here then. Bede, the first person to write anything. Father of all future poets, authors, assorted penmen, once stood where I now stand. Even before the oldest window could splash its colored petals on his head, even before the now crumbling wall encircled the city to keep serfs in and marauders out. As I walk from the cool, dark church into the dry, white sunlight, I'm startled when the stained glass red car I inadvertently crashed in front of honks at me. I stop and let pass the river of 20th century through the medieval banks. One of the other amazing things I saw when I was in England was um, the collections of manuscripts, especially at the British Museum. It was such a shock to me, I think, to see the actual pages that, that these authors and poets had written, you know, having read their books. And so this is on seeing a Keats manuscript. 
and in true Keatsian form it's a sonnet, although not exactly the way Keats writes sonnets. Intent upon the paper in the case, I study every word, each flourish and line of the manuscript. My face pressed close, I read these words in Keats' own hand. Keats touched this page, he wrote this word, the solitary poet sitting frail beneath the plum tree, soothed by the bird, wrote down Ode to a Nightingale. Despite the crowds, the guards all watchful eyes, the distance of the glass, still I see the bird whose haunting voice fills the skies, the poet listening melancholy as the hills and woods with music ring. In the museum, I hear a nightingale sing. This next poem, um, Marcia Southwick, my dissertation advisor, loves. She thinks it's hilarious. This was also one of the poems when I invited my parents to come. I was afraid they might be upset or offended. But um, keep in mind that this is fiction. This didn't happen, actually. What, what did happen was my father and I watched a show on HBO called The Man Who Saw to Tomorrow. It's a horrible show. It's about the um, prophecies of Nostradamus in which he's predicting that right now we should be in the middle of pestilence and plague and the war just around the corner, which may or may not be the case. Anyway, at that point, my father said he was going to f stockpile food. And I said, well, but we won't have enough food to feed everybody. And he said, we can't feed everybody. We can just feed ourselves. Um, and so I let my imagine, ma imagination run wild with me, and he never stockpiled food, and so it turned out all right anyway. But this is disaster. The TV prophet predicts drought, pestilence, and plague. My father stockpiles freeze-dried food, enough for himself, my mother, my sister, her baby, and me. My father says if we let my mom's folks in, they'll want to bring Uncle John and all his family. If we let my dad's parents in, they'll want to bring Aunt Peggy and Uncle Neil and all their kids. We've got to look out for ourselves, he says. He buys a rifle. But I don't want to live at their expense. Give Jenny my packets of powdered milk. Give Rachel my sacks of freeze-dried fruit and Grandma my dehydrated vegetables. I'll die with the famine before I'll survive in this merciless world. This next poem was um, written as part of an assignment. One summer I took a class from um, Colleen McElroy, who is the director of the creative writing at University of Washington. And our mission was to find a magazine, a, photo a photography magazine, and write on a picture in the magazine. And I found a picture of the model Verushka, who paints her body to blend in with whatever background she's up against. And the picture that this poem, Stones, is taken from just shows her head, which looks shaved, although I, I can't say that for sure. And her face is painted gray, and her head is gray, and her eyes are closed, and all around her are other stones that are the same colors of gray and brown. So at first, it just looks like a lot of rocks until you can just barely see her eyelashes. It's a very strange picture, and this is Stones. Stones wait quietly, barely moving an inch in a lifetime, only shifting slightly, settling in. Patiently wait centuries, unchanging, the same dull gray or brown, through seasons of uncomplaining generations. Maybe they're dormant, just waiting, passive but expectant, waiting for the right time for one to open its eyes. This next poem is still in transition. Um, it's, I, I'm revising everything because I'm finishing my dissertation. And um, this is one that's still being revised. This is Breakfast. Sleep still ringing in my ears. I fumble for my car and hurry to meet you. You call me early morning. It's my early morning. You've been up all night. I don't know what it is to you. With a few minutes, you don't have to be anywhere. You've been at work all night, creating art from sugar and flour, swirling marble designs in bright white cake batter, weaving doughs for braided bread, glazing perfectly sculpted donuts. You fill the car with the scent of donuts and fresh bread. I can't resist. I kiss your hand, nibble your ear. How tried. You're good enough to eat. I want to eat you. We drive far away from anywhere else and have breakfast.
This next poem is, I think, what would be called a sprung haiku. <laughs> You've heard of sprung sonnets. It's the same, same um, idea, I think. Scattered sparrows flutter into the nearly bare branches, brown leaves falling up into the autumn tree. This poem is my very latest effort. It's probably not finished yet, but it's, I think, close enough to read. Fog wisps rise from the dark, damp pavement, take shape against my headlights, white mist staring blankly through my windows, then disappear against the windshield. They haunt dark stretches of highways or country roads, searching every car for a familiar face, staring into every windshield. Desperate wayfarers, they run against the cars, frantically hitching a ride, some ease from their ghostly journeys, before disappearing again against a windshield, disappearing again in the dry morning hills. It seems to me that I spend all my time on the road these days, driving back and forth to Crete, and so most of my latest poems have been driving poems or road poems. This land is not flat nor plain any more than a person is. The hills roll, the road climbs the hills, then slides down the other side, skirts the curves and bridges the rivers. The road cannot contain the land. The ditches grow wild. Weeds and brambles tangle from the roadside to the weed-choked fences. The fences can't order the land or the fields they enclose. The field rows, springtime straight and even, are stubble now and chaff-strewn. And where is my order? on this solid road crawling with cracks and patches, between overgrown fences and telephone lines, tangled with one bird or clumps of birds, bringing disorder to these lines like the jumble of sounds and voices inside. How can I keep in order when the road, the fences, the telephone wires can't order the land? Can I stay safe in the pocket of this cat's cradle, the strings of disorder growing closer around me, weeds of disorder choking my fences? The next poem, Imaginary Lover, was also written based on a picture. And um, I'll, also, I, I didn't make a clean copy, but this is also a shape poem. I don't know if you can see the shape of the person. See, like, there's her knees. Imaginary Lover. She feels his hand smooth on her skin, feels his body firm beneath her, the scratch of hair, his chest against her stomach, her hair brushes his face, her back arches. She can feel his hand trace the curve of her buttocks, the curve of her leg, the weight of her body balanced where his body should be. She waits for that exquisite moment, her body taut, her leg bent, the heel of her shoe catching the light, waits for her lover to become real. The uh, last poem I want to read before I read an essay is Poet Laureate. When I was a child, my grandmother wanted me to write poems for everything, for holidays, for people's birthdays, people I didn't know. Um, she thought, you know, that it was so cute. And so I, I wrote poems for the, all the family, the, you know, for birthday cards, for holidays. And then um, when I grew up and started writing poems like these, she said, but these don't rhyme anymore. These aren't any good. And so this is Poet Laureate. I share with my grandmother poems I've written, the history of our names, remembering Grandma Murphy's kitchen and catching fireflies in her yard. These are just fine, dear, she says, but I wish you'd write poems that rhyme. Why, I remember the time you were just about 10. You wrote that poem for Catherine and Glenn about them milking cows, and everyone thought it was so good. And when I got president of my club, how you wrote such a cute poem, not like those you write now. But poems don't rhyme much anymore, I try to explain. She says, these just sound like stories. There's no poetry to them, and ousts me as family poet laureate. <laughs> Um, now I'd like to read an essay, which I think sums up my, um, my own personal poetic theory. This may or may not become the introduction to my dissertation. 
and it's called How the Romantic Poets Ruined My Life. I think every poet feels like this at least some point or another. I read my first poem when I was seven years old. It was by Christina Georgina Rossetti. I think it was called Who Has Seen the Wind? I thought the name Christina Georgina Rossetti was the most beautiful and poetic thing I'd ever heard. I liked the poem too. The next poem I remember reading was Walter de la Mer's The Listener. I was intrigued that someone who was dead while I was sitting in my second grade classroom could still make shivers run up and down my spine. When I was in fourth grade, I wrote my first poem. It was called Giant Thunder and was written in rhymed couplets of iambic tetrameter. I thought all poems had to rhyme and have the same numbers of syllables in each line. I thought that's what poems meant. My teacher praised my first poetic attempt, and I took it home to show my parents, who were equally enthusiastic. My mother may have put it on the refrigerator door. I don't remember. But I know she showed it to my grandmother. I became the poet laureate of the family. My grandmother wanted me to write poems for all the holidays and for everyone's birthdays. I was happy to oblige. After all, I was a poet. I should write poems. I continued to read poetry as well. I read Tennyson, The Eagle. I read Poe, The Raven, and everything else by Poe. I read Longfellow, The Village Blacksmith, and Hiawatha. My reading confirmed my belief that poetry rhymed and had a strong rhythm. Whenever I wrote a poem, I dutifully counted syllables and kept a rhyming dictionary close at hand. Then I read Shelley. Children should not read Shelley. <laughs> the Romantics defined the word poet, and I identified with the definition. Shelley said, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. The Romantics told me that all the stereotypes about the poet and artist were true. Poets are naturally more sensitive. Poets see, thing dif th see things differently from everyone else. The poet is the only one in society who truly understands the real issues at hand. I'd always suspected I was different from most people. I thought early that I did not belong to my family who did not read poetry or appreciate literature or classical music, all of which I was sure I did appreciate. At age 12, I thought I had read more already than both my parents. Mother read Family Circle magazine occasionally, and Daddy read Popular Mechanics. They both read Reader's Digest. But I'd read Dickens and Poe and the Romantic Poets. Now it all made sense. I was different because I was an artist. I was like Shelley. I was like Keats. I saw the world as ordinary people could not. I was a poet. This was a thrilling discovery, especially coming as it did when I was about 12 years old in 1973, just after the 60s. As a child of the 60s, I was anti-war, anti-establishment, and in, in favor of creative freedom. That's what the poets said to me. And as a poet, I was special, unique, but that I would always be completely misunderstood all my life. I kept reading, and I found out what being misunderstood meant. It meant that a poet, by definition, had to suffer. Poets killed themselves, alone in garrets, physically and emotionally starving because no one appreciated their work. Thomas Chatterton killed himself because of repeated rejection slips. Sylvia Plath couldn't take the pressure. She put her head in her oven. When I was nine, I thought being a poet meant keeping my eyes open, counting syllables, knowing how to rhyme. I was beginning to think it was going to be tougher than that. As I entered adolescence, I experienced the same feelings of doubt, despair, and questioning of self, identity, family, values that everyone else goes through at 13, except that as a poet, I'd already been going through it for a couple of years, and as a poet, I was sure my emotions were deeper, more intense, more painful than those of normal people. After all, Wordsworth himself said I was super sensitive. Shelley agreed that I saw things more deeply than the average person. I was not normal or average. I was a poet. My misery became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because I was a poet, I was going to feel more deeply and hurt more acutely. I had to suffer because I was a poet. When I was 15, I did what every normal 15-year-old does. I fell in love, and just as predictably, with a boy my parents detested. But rather than reacting in a normal way, rebelling, then coming around, I was a poet. Since I was relatively literate, I was Juliet. My parents, too, were trying to keep me from my Romeo. I wrote love poems, both rhymed and free verse. Then, like Juliet died for her love, like Chatterton died for his love, his art, I was ready to die for my love. I slipped my wrists. I did a lousy job, but I tried. The romantics were right. I was constantly misunderstood. I was too aware for my own good. I got over it, like most everyone does, but I was still a poet. I tried not to be. I studied journalism in high school. I thought I could fool my instincts. Newspaper work was writing, but it was hard facts. I thought the romantic poets couldn't find me at the school newspaper, but they did. 
I found myself drawn to feature stories instead of hard news. I tried to be creative wherever I could. I started working with graphics and imaginative layouts. I couldn't help it. I was a poet at heart. I continued trying to run away from the romantic influence. I was not going to spend a life of misery and suffering and misunderstanding. I entered college with a biology pre-med major, but in the back of my mind, I kept thinking I could write about my experiences as a doctor. During my freshman year of general education requirements, I found that I loved my literature classes and dreaded the science classes. And before the year was over, I had changed my major to English. Those poets were determined to make my life miserable. At 20, I was writing poetry and feature stories for the campus newspaper, and I was on my way toward a worthless degree. My parents didn't understand it. They asked me why I wasn't like my sister, married with a baby, happy to be a housewife and mother. If I was going to work instead of getting married, why wasn't I working towards something productive, like medicine, the law, business administration, computer science? God knows, they said, I was smart enough to be anything I wanted to be. Why wasn't I going to be anything? I told them I was going to be a writer, a poet. They declined to pay for a group of worthless degrees, so in the true romantic spirit, I moved away to live in a little garret, buying dented cans from the bargain bin at the supermarket, wondering how I'd get the money to pay tuition each semester, gathering rejection slips and writing, in hopes of eventually receiving a practically worthless PhD in creative writing. In graduate school, I kept reading poetry and reading about the poets, and I kept writing. I couldn't help writing. It was such a rush when I got the language just right, when I could recreate my life, my experiences and emotions on paper. I kept searching for the right line, the perfect metaphor, the proper form, when everything worked together to raise ordinary words and experiences to art. Every once in a while, though, it all gets to be too much for me. When the school tells me it doesn't care much whether I stay there or not, but if I do, I'll have to find some way to pay for it. When yet another editor tells me my work isn't right for that magazine, but that doesn't mean it isn't good, when I realize that, like my parents said, I'm not going to be anything, that I'll spend the rest of my life hoping some school will want me enough to pay for me, hoping any magazine will want one of my poems or stories, hoping I'll have enough money to eat supper, it doesn't seem worth it. Then I think of the painting of Chatterton, the rejection slip in his hand, the peaceful look on his face after he ate the poison. I think of Anne Sexton's constant struggle with her art and emotion before she breathed her last in the family garage. I realize I'm destined for a life of suffering and misunderstanding. They told me that all along, but sometimes I want out. If no one had told me when I was nine that I was a poet, if I hadn't been encouraged by my teachers and my family to read and write, if I hadn't read Wordsworth, I might today be one of the normal people instead of a super sensitive, a poet. If I hadn't fallen in love with the name Christina Georgina Rossetti, I might today be a computer science major with no worries about finding a job or where my next meal was coming from. If I hadn't been a poet and all that entails all my life, I might not be so miserable today. God damn you, Shelley, it's all your fault. <laughs> Luckily, that didn't happen. I got a job. I got a real job. So it turns out that I um, did turn out to be something. Um, and I thank you for your time. If anyone has anything they'd like to say or questions they'd like to ask, I'm here. If not, question? <laughs> That's my dad. <laughs> okay, thank you.